on. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to 1025 in Conversation. This is episode four. I'm Jordan Walton, and today I'm bringing on a very special guest. I recently was introduced to her via her artist talk at my school, the University of West Georgia, and that is Lillian Garcia Rogue. First off, Lillian, I just want to say thank you so much for being on 1025 in Conversation. It's awesome to have you here. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jordan. It was lovely meeting you at the talk and answering some questions. So I look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Now, first off, if you could just tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm, uh, I'm a painter. I'm also a professor at Florida State University. Um, been there 20 years, was at UT Austin before that, but always did a bunch of drawing and painting my whole life, uh, kind of obsessed by looking. And uh, I've been over the years making uh, larger and larger on-site landscape paintings made of kind of various components as large as they'll fit in my truck. Um, and I've always been fascinated with the idea of trying to reconcile the illusionistic possibilities of painting with its kind of abstract and, and real material nature. So I wanna make images that both seem specific to the site I'm on so that you can go and identify that tree, that place. But at the same time, when you get up close, hopefully they break down and you kind of go, whoa, that's just a bunch of crazy painting up there. How does that work, right? So I kind of want both said that kind of material and abstract nature, but that specificity. And um, so yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, over the years, they've kind of grown, like I said, to go bigger and bigger namely by making components uh, together. And um, I'm here because part of this Blackwell Prize in painting uh, allows you or invites you to come and do uh, some work here because it's for, from what I understand, it's really for a perceptually based painter, it doesn't have to be landscape. And I definitely fall into that category. I paint outside, all day, you know, is the light is changing. So I, I like that. I like the change and the challenge, right? Um, and so I came here and I did some research. I always like to find out when I go to a new place a little bit about its history. And uh, I found some interesting things about the, you know, about Noonan. And I tried to paint at places that seem to have a significance to, let's say, each of the three major populations that have lived around here. So the Native Americans, the Creeks, the uh, African Americans, and, you know, the essentially the white settlers, right? So, yep. um, and, and, you know, so lots of stuff here. Yeah, that's, that's great. Because when I was at your talk, and you pulled up many of your paintings, like, I just love the amount of detail in your paints, because it feels like you can actually reach in and touch, you know, the certain brush strokes and the certain paint blotches and all that stuff. I just found that really interesting. Now, one of the things I always like to ask artists that come on 1025 in conversation are is the inspiration. Growing up, what inspired what was the artist that actually inspired you to actually want to become a painter? Or what was the thing that actually kept the the ball rolling for you to be like, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life growing up? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great question. And it's also kind of a complex one, because I would say it's not any one thing. It definitely wasn't any one artist. But um, I was there was two maybe main components. One is I always lived in my eyes. You know how some people live in their heads, they're daydreaming and they might trip over something. Right. I was the opposite. I, I was that kid that would go, oh my God, like, look, look at, look at that squirrel eating that, you know, whatever, or look at that lizard. And people would go, what, what? I don't see anything, you know, and I'd point to it. And so I was always hypersensitive, you know, hyper aware of movement, colors, things. I just liked looking at things, right? Um, yeah. I, I was also, uh, I'm slightly dyslexic. I mean, I'm dyslexic enough that reading is hard. And so, um, you know, some, it's not that I can't read <laughs> and it's not that I don't enjoy it, but it's, it's not like writing is difficult for me. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a little more painful. Whereas the drawing, I could always also draw very well, right? So that having that kind of natural interest and ability was helpful. But then also the other part of it was that my dad in particular really um, 
liked going to, you know, the Natural History Museum or the Art Museum, or we would drive in the car to go visit a small town. I grew up in Houston and, and Houston, um, you know, so just exploring, you know, going to small towns. Uh, so, so there was a lot of, I guess, experiences that I had where I could look at things. Um, and that helped, I think, um, like, I think it's wonderful, like, you know, that you came to the talk, right? I think the more exposure one has to different things, then the more one's eyes and minds can open to the possibility of they themselves maybe doing that, right? Or studying right. that or just being there, right? Going to a different place. So that's a, that, that's a great, you know, answer that you brought up because, you know, when I was growing up, like me personally, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. So like I was just surrounded by a bu bunch of culture, you know, yeah. and me personally, I view Atlanta as like the epicenter for black culture now, yeah. you know, originally it was like Harlem and, you know, South Central. But now, now that yeah. I'm growing up in this environment, it's like, okay, I can, I can create my art and honor who I am as a person. I just found that yeah. really cool. Yeah, and Atlanta now with all the filming, you know, it's really a film, you know, epicenter. So, and, and you're right, it's, I think it has become in many ways the, um, the new Harlem in that the, the newest things, uh, definitely said so the bulk of, of cinema, right? Yeah. And television is happening there, but also the art scene. Um, and it's been there for a while, but you're right. It's, it's now um, really just blown up and it's pretty amazing. So you're very fortunate to already have connections there. Right, and already have grown up in that, you know, yeah. area. Yeah. Now, now, for many artists, there's always a distinction between the two cultures that they're probably grown up in, you know what I mean? Uh, I could I could even point out somebody like Andy Warhol, who was a pioneer for uh, pop art, and then he went and transitioned into more of like a minimalistic type of aesthetic with his films like Harlem, well, not Harlem, Empire, Sleep, and all that. Is there a distinction between the two cultures that you personally have grown up in while creating your art? Because I believe in the talk, you said that you were born in Cuba, right? Yeah, yeah. So actually, um, yes, I was born in Cuba, but I was, we, I was born in, in yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my age. I was born in 1966 and we left in late 68. So it was before, right before I turned three. So I don't have any firsthand memories of Cuba. A lot of people, when you hear of a lot of people leaving Cuba, they either left quite a bit earlier than I did, like in 59 or 60 or 61, or they left later in the 70s, or they might have even been, you know, born here. There's a lot of Cubans that, that continue to come. So I'm kind of a, what I would call an in-between generation where I don't remember Cuba. And yet my whole experience of growing up in America was colored by the fact that my parents, like many Cubans, I think never quite acclimated because I think Cubans, um, this might be interesting for your audience, Cubans are somewhat somewhat unique um, in that most Cubans are technically refugees, right? They, they came here thinking they'd go back to Cuba. Right. So because of that, a lot of them really never said they didn't intend to stay here. So they didn't really want to assimilate. They were like, oh no, we'll go back one day. And so in their mind, they were still living as though they were in Cuba. And I say this because little things like if I wanted to go to a sleepover at a friend's house, they, you know, I, the response would be, but we don't do that in Cuba. Yeah. Well, it's like, well, but wait a minute, you know, so I, I, you know, in my mind, I'd be going, but I'm, we're not in Cuba, you know, I'm growing exactly. up, here. I'm, I'm not growing up in Cuba, right? So why can't I go do normal things, you know? You know, so it was always, oh, in Cuba, we don't, in Cuba, we don't, therefore you can't. And so I kind of had to bide my time and figure out how to assimilate on my own. And assimilate isn't quite the right word because I guess I wanted to assimilate knowing I couldn't quite assimilate. Um, and although, you know, I'm a pretty light-skinned Latina, I grew up in Texas and in Texas, there was plenty of prejudice and, against Hispanics. And, you know, with a name like Garcia, I got called, you know, I have dark hair and dark eyes. And, you know, in the summer I get nice and tan. And so, you know, there was a lot of disparaging sort of things and you know so I had to kind of navigate that on my own um but I say the all this because I think all these things that 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 get thrown at us regardless of you know where we're at you know you have to kind of be true to yourself and um hopefully you can kind of grow from that and understand that it's not you it's other people's you know ignorance or it's other people's you know lack of whatever 
yeah you know fear whatever it is um and you have to you know not let that get the most of you and hopefully convert it into something because in my case these kind of component pieces and this desire to go paint in places that seem to be, I would say, you know, fairly raw. I mean, they're not all natural because, you know, let's face it all, most of the country's been modified, right, through one thing or the other, even if it looks wild, but it's my way to connect to a place and kind of feel like I belong. Yeah. And I find that this discovery of, you know, working over the course of the entire day and painting stuff that maybe no one else really cares about, I'm like, well, if I look at it long enough, I can discover stuff that other people don't notice. And so that's almost my personal said, connection to place. Yeah. Um, and then these big component pieces have become another element of me thinking about kind of this migration theme of, you know, a lot of people are all about, oh, I don't want other people coming into my community. But the reality is we're all immigrants. I yeah. mean, even, I mean, I think I just read the other day that I think they found evidence of, um, one of the oldest people that they've discovered in, in the uh, Americas and it's someone of Asian descent because they've always known that that probably, you know, uh, early people came over that Bering Strait because the land mass would have been. So in a way, we've all migrated and immigrated one way or another, right? Whether we walked, whether we were put on boats, right? Whether yeah. we flew here, right? We're, we're, a, we're a world full of immigrants. So we're all immigrants. So this idea of, you know, I don't want someone new coming in because this is the way it is. It's like people, I think people need to, you know, get over that because right. <laughs> you know, just look at yourself, you, you know, think about when you immigrated here. Um, and it's, uh, and so in my work, I like putting pieces that are standalone individual panels together with other panels from a non contiguous space, let's say you know, they, they were painted in the same, you know, usually general region, but then I put things together and I discover sort of new perceptual spaces, you know, your eye just goes, oh, that kind of now looks like, and then your eye, you know, as you focus in, you might notice a space, but then you, you realize, wait a minute, that doesn't quite connect, but that's interesting. Now there's a new space right. where there wouldn't have been had I not put these two things that didn't belong together, together. Exactly. So I think, you know, that to me is this, you know, kind of migration metaphor, right? That new spaces are created when in two individuals from different places combine, right? Or meet. Right, right. At the end. It yeah. is, it's very interesting when you bring up the fact that, yeah, the United States is a world full of immigrants and how some of the best art can come out of these certain societies that we live in. Because like, if you take me, for example, like with my podcast, this was born out of the uh, the summer of 2020, with, you know, the George Floyd situation, the social unrest that were happening. And then I literally had this idea over the summer. I was like, OK, let's see. What if I actually made a podcast? And I had a conversation with my friends and I just automatically bur blurted it out. I was like, hey, do you guys want to start a podcast? And they already was like, yeah, I'm here for it. Yeah. And that was awesome. That was awesome. A great feeling. Yeah. Now, in everyday life, as an artist, in our everyday life, we have to keep being inspired. Uh, the scariest thing to me as an artist is that the day that you don't be uninspired, you feel like you didn't accomplish your goal. What in your every, everyday life do you do to kind of keep you more inspired and keep your creative juices flowing? Well, I mean, I think I'll go back to this idea of just discovery, right? Um, noticing something. Um, one of the things I, uh, when I teach drawing or even painting, I talk a lot about just looking, slowing down and looking, you know, don't assume you know what something is and then just draw it out of your head. So like I force my students to do a number in painting. There's like three or four uh, perceptually based assignments. And I explain to them, look, I know you're probably going to want to work from photographs and use a combination of photographs and other things. And I understand why people want to do that. And actually, that's a great thing to do, have other sources. But for these assignments, these are the reasons why I'm going to force you to work from life. You know, you can get certain things. I'm trying to slow you down and really look and give you tools to kind of analyze and compare and contrast and be able to see more than one um, monocular, right? Because that's what a camera right. is. It's a one monocular view that really radically changes the colors and the value tones. I mean, it really, a photograph it, um, exaggerates tonal changes and it can't capture all the various color nuances. Your eye's way more sensitive. So I basically talk a lot about 
and teach a lot about slowing down and looking. So I say this because I think in my own life, I don't know where the inspiration is going to come from. Um, but I hope that something piques my interest, whether I'm reading it, whether I'm, you know, even on Instagram. I mean, I don't use Instagram passively. You know, if I find an interesting artist that, you know, that maybe like my work or I'm looking at something and I go, oh, that's interesting. You know, someone sharing someone else's work. I'll go to that person's website. I'll do research on them. You know, I'll, I'll try to yeah. learn about their practice, you know, what they're doing. Um, you know, I read, you know, I, I you know, we do. Um, yeah, so I, I'm always just, you never know. And even here, like when I came to noon and all I knew was how much, how many canvases I could bring in my truck. Uh, yeah, I wanted to maximize that. And I knew that I had to, that I was gonna work on site somewhere. I didn't know where at the time. I'd done research, like I mentioned, um, but I had not picked out any places yet because that involves going somewhere and seeing if it, right has kind of maybe that potential. Can I even get the truck? I mean, sometimes it's as simple as, can I even drive up to this spot and paint, right? Exactly. Um, and then from there, I just, I'm, I'm open to to seeing what comes. And, and yeah, I haven't been here that long, but I've, I've, I've made 10 paintings since I've been here, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a lot of paintings for the number of days I've been here. Um, right. And it's really come in a very natural flow. Um, the first place I had no intention necessarily of painting of, but I had an intention of going to, was when I read that Noonan had the only African-American, um, they called it museum. I think it, it's really more of a research center in the county. I thought, okay, that'll be a great place for me to go and talk to folks and see, you know, if there's any sites that might be, you know, of interest that I can get to, you know, around here. And when I got there, the place is only open on Wednesday. So I got there like on a weekend. Um, and it turned out that it was this site that was very much like places that I normally paint at, which is a very nondescript place. Because I, I think, you know, you may know the history, but it's, it's, a, it's a cemetery. It's actually the largest African-American slave cemetery in the yeah. South that we know of, that we know of, right? Um, and right now it's a four acre spot. And the only reason we know of it is because about 15 or 20 years ago, um, they were going to develop, do some sort of park or some sort of path through it. And some old timers in town, I mean, they were both uh, from the black community and white community, thought, you know, they kind of thought, you know, we think that that's actually an old slave cemetery because it was part of the Berry found, uh, family plantation. Um, and there was one little headstone that they found. And so that was enough to convince the city to stop. And they did some uh, LIDAR, some of these uh, uh, scanning, you know, radar type of things. And they discovered almost 240 bodies. So, but when you go there now, you don't see, there's no, there's no headstones on anything, right? Just that one little one. And it just looks like, you know, some oak trees, some pine trees, and some, you know, low kind of grass and a lot of poison ivy. Right. And there's a few markers of uh, white uh, PCV pipes with orange on top and a few of those orange flags that are poked in areas where they know there's certain graves. I mean, they're not all marked, but it's really a little eerie because you, you look at this, this site and it just looks like an open, you know, a couple acres of land. And then you see a couple of these little orange flags. And so I really was like, wow, you know, this is, you know, because I knew the history, I knew that these flags weren't just like, I'm gonna build like a path down here. Like this is where right. a body, a family might be, you know, that worked here maybe for generations. And so I really felt compelled to paint that site because it was both, you know, what I normally do, which is a, a seemingly nondescript site, right? Um, but in this case, it had such extra weight knowing the history. And so I got permission. I didn't go into the, the grave site. I just painted off the side of the road, but I painted three different parts and I waited to paint the central image with, uh, I knew I wanted to have a triptych kind of like, um, you know, in, in, you know, in churches, they often will have triptychs, right? So I wanted the central piece uh, to be one of those um, markers, a tall white marker with, and there was one that had a smaller one. And I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, I don't know this because there's no specific um, uh, history that I could get at this point about it, but I'm assuming it's more than one body, maybe a young, you know, a, a small in the center. And I know you're not supposed to put your, you know, like a 
you know, a, something right in the middle of a painting, but I purposely wanted to put this right in the middle of the painting. I had a vision yeah. for the orange has to be kind of, kind of going up. I wanted, you know, I painted all day. I wanted there to be a sense of, in a way, joy or redemption. Yeah. You know, I wanted it to be, you know, a, a painting about connecting to this place and really seeing the, the, the beauty and yet acknowledging Very what this was, right? And so that was the first, you know, so those were the first three paintings. And if you had asked me, before I showed up to noon, and if I was going to be painting, you know, this place, I would have said, no, yeah. <laughs> um, right, and so, and then that made me think of, well, okay, you know, I wanted to do something, I was doing research on the Creek Indians, and seeing if you guys had any, like, mounds, and so forth, and there weren't really mounds in the proper Noonan area, I mean, I know about the whole Macintosh, you know, reserve, and all of that, but it turns out that one of the places I was invited to paint at the the people that own the the place uh there were some areas that were kind of undeveloped and you could still see she was she pointed out that you could see a lot of terracing that the creek indians had made to uh preserve um you know to keep the runoff right it, it's like an um it's it was something that they did to be able to farm and keep you know the soil kind of richer and so you could see on this property all these terracings i mean yeah. it's subtle but it's there and so that, so I was like, wow, I'm actually standing on, you know, what clearly was Creek land, right? So I thought that there, I couldn't find any. And in fact, I was on there. And then she showed me this, um, this, it, it was a modern day recreation of like a, um, uh, the history of the land. And it actually said that this land, the original white settlers that got this land, they got it, it was part of the South Lottery on February 3rd, 1827. They were awarded, and this wasn't this family, it was the original, you know, settlers. And, you know, I know the history that in, you know, two years before, the Creek Indians were forced to cede all the land in this county, right? And so two years later, this land goes into, quote, a lottery for the Georgia white settlers to get, right? Um, and so it was really kind of fascinating that I had inadvertently happened on land that I did not know when I went there to paint had all this history until said the current owners pointed out the the terracing by the Creek Indians on yeah. part of their land and so so that's kind of how it is you know you're open to discovering I mean I do research you know I'm, I'm aware right um but and I I but I'm like wow okay um here's a connection I'm I'm um you know I'm, so then I was able to paint a triptych. I did a, a, a triptych on that land and I focused on fallen logs. And I wasn't thinking the metaphor of seeded lands or fallen, you know, I wasn't necessarily thinking that. And yet each of the three paintings I did on, from that land all involved trees that were dead or dying, fallen, yeah. right? Um, you know, and that, that's the cycle too, right? Trees naturally die, they don't live forever. But um, so now I'm thinking that that was an interesting kind of metaphor to connect back to that history. Um, yeah, and so after I did those two, then to me, the logical next step was, okay, well then can I paint on some plantation land, right? That's still yeah. being farmed, right? Um, and it turns out that in this county, there are no current cotton, um, uh, I guess, uh, farms or anything happening now. They're all a little further, I guess. There, there's plenty surrounding this county, but there's none in Noonan. So I wanted to, so the other big thing in Noonan in terms of the white settlers were the mills, right? The mills really were what brought the wealth yeah. to this community on top of, you know, the cotton, right? And the slaves and, the, you know, all that. But but the mills were, were a big thing after the Civil War. So I went to find out, so I went to paint on some properties that had, that were owned by the mill folks, right? I didn't want to paint, you know, I wanted to stay with the landscape. And then just to finalize that, I knew that there was that Mills battleground, the, the Confederate battle uh, field that's in town, that was the uh, one of the few, uh, I guess, wins for the Confederacy, right? It, it, they, they kind of, um, they defeated, I guess, Sherman's army for a little bit, but it made Sherman actually change his strategy in Atlanta, yeah. right? And so I went there and I did my final painting. Okay. Was it the Confederate battleground? So I feel like I've touched on each of the kind of major, um, 
you know, historical, you know, groups of people that were involved in creating Noonan as it is now, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, as I said, Jordan, this was not my idea coming up here. I just said, I'm, you know, I got these canvases, I'm going to paint on site, right. I'm going to see what I can find. So going back to this, you know, just being open, right? And then seeing where, where, where one thing leads to another. Right. That, that was a very impactful history lesson. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so now when it comes, well, next question. When it comes to creating, a lot of artists nowadays, they either go with the old way of painting, you know, physical, you know, all that. A lot of people do it digitally now too. Yeah. When you're working in your sort of environment, what's the biggest, what's the thing that you personally, what's the equipment However, do you like to use the most? You know what I mean? Is it, do you like doing digital or do you stick to the old fashioned oh, way of physical? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I personally, you know, I'm, I'm too old to have kind of grown up with the digital stuff. I mean, I'm old school um, painting, drawing, but the, the paint always appealed to me um, when I first tried painting in high school. I mean, first of all, I come from a photo realist background in high school. I mean, most people learn how to draw first, right? And I... Right learn how to draw, you know, I could do the 9H to 9B situation, I could draw from life, I could draw from photos, so I got technically very proficient with that, but when I picked up paint, I assumed I was going to be a photorealist painter, just because, you know, that's what I was doing with drawing, but what happened is early on, I really just did not want to flatten the paint out, like I liked that visceral quality to that materiality that paint could give me that graphite couldn't and right. so yes I forced myself to draw you know do the layers and be more photorealistic but I realized that I don't want to I enjoy being in the moment I don't enjoy going okay I'm gonna now plan for what I'm gonna do and I know it's gonna take me 150 steps and I have the patience to do that I'm like you know I did that kind of withdrawing yeah. And, you know, so so paint could kind of give me this sort of, I don't know, more of a push pull that, you know, it just had this, you know, I, I, I'm not a good sculptor, like I'm not technically, maybe this is as close to sculpture as I can get maybe this little bit of materiality. So, so the digital stuff, there's no, um, you know, because I paint on site, you know, there's no real point for me to take a computer and then have this translation of something I'm looking at on a screen, you know, although artists like David Hockney, who you know also paints on site. He paints in different things, but he's known. Uh, he he would do these little paintings a day of just little still lives and things, and send on his iPad to his friends and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so it's not that I wouldn't consider that, but I just um, I've not. Um, I guess I don't need to be drawing all the time, and so when I do, I really love the brushes, you know, the gloves. I mean, I wear gloves and I stick my finger in the paint and I squeeze, you know, tubes out. Um, and it's really, um, you know, it's definitely a dialogue with nature, but there's a lot of physical pushing and pulling. And so for me, um, I go a little crazy when I'm doing the mouse or the, you know, I guess tablets are better, um, but there's just something about me needing to touch. Yeah. And more than a pad. But but um, I think if I were, you know, 30 years younger, um, I'd be curious, you know, I'd be curious if 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 I would, you know, be interested in what I'm doing now or if I'd be all over, you know, the stuff you can do with animation and um, even virtual reality now and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I wonder like I even wonder if someone like, you know, Michelangelo, if he had been or Leonardo da Vinci, even better. I mean, if he had been alive today. Would he really have been doing drawings with oil painting or would he be one of these VR people, right? You know, because he was always experimenting, right? Pushing right. what was the most, you know, modern thing for his time. Right. Right. So I don't know. I mean, right now I, I don't have, um, I mean, if I were to be invited to be in a group, right, that, uh, that said, hey, Lillian, we have, you know, someone who really is a digital, you know, a, let's say a VR genius and we can collaborate let's collaborate on an idea that sounds really fun to me yeah but the learning curve on knowing the tools to be able to do things at the level people do it at it's just way too steep for me to jump into that on my own definitely yeah. I definitely so, oh oh you can keep going oh that was it oh okay 
I definitely agree with that because, you know, when you're working in a digital space, which I've tried, you know, many times, it's very, very complex. Like I remember when I used Photoshop for the first time and I was like, how do people, you know, how do people use this stuff? And all the tabs were locked and all that stuff. And it, it, it takes a lot of time. You just got to learn it, you know, yeah. especially yeah, well, it's a- my age. Yeah, well, and even, I mean, there's that old saying that to be an expert in anything, you need at least, what, 10,000 hours of right. work in it. So, right. you know, I think that, and, and that's why this idea of working with teams or collaborating is exciting, right? Um, because you don't have to learn everything yourself. Yeah. But you, you need someone who knows how to, you know, how to do some of it, so. I definitely agree. Now, when it comes to creating your paintings, what's the main message that you try to encapsulate while expressing? Well, what's the main message that you try to push in your work when you're creating? Yeah, well, I don't think I'm trying to push any message per se. I think I just want you to to use perception like I use as a way to be sensitive to something and then possibly think about it, right? Bring your own, you know, I, I don't wanna say baggage, that, that's a negative word, but you know, bring your own experiences, right? Your own history to, to it. And then maybe look a little deeper too, right? You know, use that as a springboard. Um, you know, it has been interesting cause I've, I've met a few people in town where when I tell them where I'm painting, they go, oh, where's that? I've never heard of that. Or I didn't know that, you know, and here I am someone who's not from here. Right. But I spent a lot of, you know, I did spend time digging and researching and trying to find, you know, getting a a grasp of the general, you know, history, right, from different perspectives, you know, um, because some sources will give you one perspective and not the other. Right. So you kind of have to kind of dig. So. um, So I hope that like maybe, you know, if people see um, maybe people who have never been to the Farmer Street Cemetery. I mean, this place is only, it's less than a mile away from where I'm staying right here. It's, it's less than a mile away from the big cemetery in town. Um, it's right next to the skate park, right okay. behind the skate park. That's the African-American slave cemetery. Okay. Most people have driven by it, didn't know it was there because again, it looks like just an open lot of land with no real marker other than that one sign that says farmer street cemetery Mm. so you know maybe just people you know oh maybe i'll go there you know maybe you know um there'll be more interest because i think that's a pretty um, you know significant thing to be able to say that noonan has you know the largest you know african-american slave cemetery in the south let's just say that out loud that's impressive and I, and I think that, you know, that's something that, um, you know, and they were able to save it and they should be proud of that. And hopefully it could just be, you know, possibly more um, known. Yeah. Um, I think it's a pretty special place. So, you know, so just things like that. It's not, um, uh, you know, people will, will see like when I paint in Florida, if I go to certain, you know, places they go, oh, I've never realized that places, you know, has that or is that interesting? Maybe I'll go see it, you know, so it's really more of having an experience where they connect to the place or at least might want to go and try to themselves connect to the place. Yeah. Now you bring up Florida. When it comes to actually living in Florida, does that setting sort of kind of inspire you when it comes to your artwork? Because a lot of people, when they live in Florida, they take like the environment around them and they're like, okay, I'm going to use this and I'm going to like uh, do some graffiti or I'm going to use this and do like make some music or all that. Does living in Florida kind of provide that extra dose of inspiration for your artwork? Well, I mean, I think anywhere I am or anyone is, is what will provide some sort of inspiration, right? Because, you know, you you know, you, you use your local to hopefully, you know, have a springboard to something more universal, right, that other people can connect to. And so, I mean, I didn't grow up in Florida. I grew up in Texas. So, you know, Texas had its own thing and even different yeah. parts of Texas. I mean, Florida is not quite as radically different as Texas. Um, but, you know, Texas, they get snow and they're all, you know, dry open field. And then they have the big bend in the south and Florida. You know, when we think of Florida, we think of Miami. Right. But what people often don't don't know necessarily is that the northern part of Florida is a lot more, at least like Tallahassee, 
I mean, the big joke is that it's Southern Georgia. I mean, yeah. we have, <laughs> you know, we have big oak trees, you know, with the Spanish moss. I mean, uh, we're 45 minutes away from water, about an hour and a half away from really gorgeous water, like that Emerald Coast. But we're not on the coast. We're, we're essentially the armpit of Florida. And so the and things freeze over there. So like we don't have all those when you think of palm trees and all those tropical plants that you see in Miami, you know, those are house plants for us because you know, they would all die if they were outside. Right. So, um, so even Florida has these kind of di di different parts where you're at, you'll have different inspiration. So I have to figure out how to paint locally somehow since I live there. And so I have, you know, driven around and discovered, you know, and painted things that I did not have in Texas. Um, and my painting did change some when I, uh, quite a bit in a way, when I moved to Florida because, um, you know, there's palmetto palms everywhere and palms are interesting formally because they're, you know, you have to get their shape right, but at the same time, you know, the color changes on them and they do move. And so how do you, how do you paint something that actually has, you know, not just a, a linear, you know, little leafy small form, but a big solid yeah. form that doesn't look too static, right? Um, and so I had to solve that problem, right? So I think anywhere I, I would paint, like here, you know, I'd never painted in this part. I had to, so, you know, I think what you'll notice is even the, the triptych that I did on the, um, on the original creek land, uh, it's more dense woods, right? It, it was uncut kind of forest. So you'll see lots of leaves and browns and warm colors in it. The one that was done in the, um, African-American cemetery is more of just kind of your normal greens and ivy and um, just because that's what that looked like. So, I mean, I think everyone gets influenced, you know, okay. you know, what, you know, the music they heard, what, what their parents play growing up, you know, what was in your house, what's in your neighborhood, what can you get to outside absolutely. of your neighborhood, right? Yeah, absolutely. The whole world is full of inspiration. And yeah. Grace, that's the best thing about art. Now, the final question for this interview, and this is uh -huh. this is a question I always like to ask certain artists because when you're growing up and you always and you have this idea that you want to do something different from everything that your family was doing, uh -huh. it, it comes with a lot of skepticism. Take me yeah. for example. When I was in ninth grade, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Now, I told everybody that I wanted to be a filmmaker, and then it came across very skeptical. And I was like, eh, is that really what you want to do? And then I proved them wrong many times, right? So my question, the final question to you, Lillian, is what would you tell the young version of yourself who wanted to get into painting as well as the young, as any young artist that's watching this interview right now? What would you like to tell them as well as the younger version of yourself? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, I want to kind of double down on something that, that you said about just, you know, the it sounds like you 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 knew a little bit of or more than normal what you wanted to do, right? You knew in your heart you wanted to be a filmmaker. It might not have made sense to you or your family um, at the time. I mean, my parents did not want me to be an art major. And yet, you know, they, we'd go to an art museum. They let me take art classes when I was young. But when it came to thinking about that as a choice for college, you know, being immigrants, right? You know, most immigrants or first generation, um, you know, if you're first generation uh, college or your parents were first generation college, there's a lot of pressure on kids to have a degree that seems to be more likely that you will immediately get a job, right? So in Absolutely. my case, I was to study either medicine, engineering, possibly law or business. They were the the, you know, because those were things that my parents understood as, oh, you can, you know, your child will have a reasonably good chance of having a at least normal economic life. Whereas an artist is scary, right? An artist is something that almost, you know, you often see, um, I would see this a lot teaching that many of the kids that are art majors come from more affluent families because they have a cushion to fall back on, right? The parents can say, yeah. sure, pursue your dream because they're not worried about if the child is going to financially be okay, right? They may have, you know, they'll have a home or whatever, you know, I mean, you know what I mean, right? And so, yeah, exactly. so I think, yeah, so I think that it's extra hard on 
families that don't come from wealth or are first or you know generation college to you know they want the best for their child they've usually invested a lot to help them go to school right i mean most kids are working jobs and doing all this so it's not that the parents don't want you to do what you love i think it's, there is this fear of we know this is a harder path exactly so i so i i know that the, it comes from a good place but i think going to your you know my young self and it sounds like you too i was in spanish there's this term called cabezota which means hard headed and I think that actually being hard-headed is is good to a certain, you know, you don't want to be so hard-headed that you're narrow-minded, right? Yeah. Um, and just, you know, don't, but you know, this idea of being hard-headed really can translate into like knowing thyself, right? If you have a true passion and interest, you know, you have to be realistic about if, if it's going to be hard, right? An art degree is not an easy path, but it's a viable path. And if, and if it's a path, and if it's something that gives you joy, you know, you have to acquire the skills you need to then be successful. And you have to understand that it's a long game, right? That you're not going to instantly graduate and get the 50 or 80 or $100,000 job. But it doesn't right. mean you can't, you know, so you have to be realistic, right? So it's like, okay, how can I, you know, hone my different skills? You know, what sort of jobs can I do that give me enough time to continue to do my creative things? How can I build my artist network? You know, like you having this podcast, you know, um, you know, reaching out to your folks and, you know, having your bigger network now, like this is a wonderful, this is exactly what you should be doing. Cause you know, you're building, so this network, um, now, you know, more people, someone who didn't know you before might go, wow, this Jordan guy, he's really interesting. I might want to hire him for this next film to do something or to do my PR for this. Right. Absolutely. So you have, yeah. So you have to be smart about that it's, it's, you know, that, that you have to sit, acquire skills, work hard, and know it's not going to be a straight path, right? It's going to be a little zigzag, but if you want something and, and, and you're passionate about it, I think your parents hopefully will support you. And if not, you know, you have to do what you have to do. Um, and um, so really just trust thyself, but then also to smell the coffee. It is hard. Right. But it doesn't mean it's unobtainable. It just means it's going to be harder. Absolutely. But I'd rather do something that's hard, uh, that makes me happy than something that's easy and gives me a bunch of money. Right. Makes me exactly. miserable. And other. So that's the, you hit it right on the head. Right. To be honest with you, because it's like a lot of people, they just want to do something that is easy and could give them a lot of money. Yeah. But in the reality, like, I want to do something that I'm proud of doing like this. I'm proud. I love doing this podcast, you know, and it's just is I just love creating. I love making art. I love doing all that stuff. And I'm just glad that I'm still, you know, happy and I'm still interviewing great artists. So, yeah. But uh that concludes our interview. Lillian, thank you so much for being on 1025 In Conversation. I know I said that a billion times, but I truly mean it. Well, thank you for having me. And I look forward to seeing your uh, continued successes, Jordan. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. The I was about to say 1025 podcast. Thank you guys for watching 1025 In Conversation. I'm Jordan Keith Walton, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace. Bye.